Um, I'd like to bring in with us here, we are so lucky to have one of our greatest trailblazers here with us, NG's Chief Digital Officer, Yves Legillard. Yves, welcome, and please introduce yourself to our audience today. Yes, hello everyone, and uh, it's also a great pleasure to be with you. My name is Yves. I've been running uh, digital and IT at uh, energy group NG. Uh, NG is, uh, is a Paris-based uh, global energy company operating in uh, more than 40 countries with uh, about a turnover of 60 billion and 170,000 employees. So quite a, quite a large organization. Uh, we are active in the fields of renewable, we're active in the fields of uh, networks, and we're also active in the fields of uh, energy solutions to help customers uh, go and engage on their zero carbon agenda. We're actually a fairly, uh, fairly old company. We have deep roots. Uh, we have a passion for very large infrastructure. The very first thing that we built and that uh, is still in use and uh, has an impact on planet Earth was the Suez Canal, and that was uh, many years ago. So we are uh, indeed in large infrastructure and looking forward to the future in the field of, uh, of, of a green future. Yeah, thank you, Eve, and I'm so glad to have you here with us today. Um, so in the session uh, that we have here, we're going to talk about the accelerated transition to clean energy and the impacts this transition is having on both energy and utility providers, as well as, as the changing relationship between energy consumers and energy providers. Um, and I've been really so looking forward to this today because I think we have this great opportunity for conversation between a global producer of energy with sustainability goals and targets to, goals and targets to meet, and also a global provider, um, sorry, a procurer and a provider of energy, um, and, and you with NGE responding um, to the changing needs of customers and striving to really lead in that transition to cleaner energy sources. So thrilled to have you both uh, join us here. And we're going to bring up a couple of graphics to kind of key off the conversation here. Um, the first talks about 81% of the world's electricity comes from fossil fuels. Um, and, and it's really, it's a global issue and it needs global solutions. Um, and as we as we begin to kind of think about this further, emission reduction and sustainable, uh, sustainable solutions uh, in order to combat climate change are really top of mind for us at Salesforce Industries uh, here in our energy and utilities group. And this has been, you know, a large part Eve, of the NG story for as long as we've collaborated as well and, and much longer for, for you there at NG. Um, so Eve, you've spoken at a few dream forces and from the very beginning, NG and our Salesforce journey together has been about partnering together to support you in your mission to be the premier global supplier of net zero energy. Will you tell us a little bit about the progress that NG has made toward that goal over the past couple of years and where you see you're going? Yes, with pleasure. So as uh, our long-term partner at Salesforce, you know well that NG is recognized as actually an early mover in uh, climate commitments since years. Uh, actually, what's happening right now is that the pace is accelerating with tremendous opportunities for us, for the industry that uh, we will seize. We're entering in a new growth cycle, driven both by increasing climate commitments uh, and robust energy demand from all our customer segments, industry, local authorities, individuals. Uh, it's very important for a, a citizen, for an employee in a large organization to give a purpose to the new world. And renewables development is booming, and the world is expected to more than triple its renewable capacity over the next 20 years, adding more than 7,000 gigawatts. So for those who are not familiar with uh, our industry, one gigawatt is the power that is produced by a nuclear power plant. So 7,000 gigawatts is a large, a very large amount of power. Many governments are prioritizing climate actions in their recovery plans as uh, we come out from the pandemic. Uh, there is a strong momentum and there is a, a tough global competition, uh, a competition that, of course, doesn't stand still. And it's very important for us to keep, uh, to keep up this, this competition. While we're pleased that our peers have joined this fight, in particular from the oil and gas field, we clearly intend to remain at the forefront of the race against climate change. And to remain a leader, NG has taken an important step since our last uh, Dreamforce together. 
Uh, and actually, we, we've changed quite a bit. First, I'm, I'm proud to uh, share with you that NG announced just last month its, commi its commitment to become net zero by 2045 across all scopes, one, two, and three. The combination and breadth of this commitment, which includes scope three, makes this more challenging than most of our peers. Second, we will continue to step up our renewable growth from three gigawatt installed this year to six gigawatt uh, by 2025, with a global target of 80 gigawatt installed by 2030. And third, we're focusing our services activities. I mentioned that in the introduction about our company. We have a big services business towards distributed energy infrastructure. We're a front runner in this market, one of the global leaders, and already have strong leadership positions in businesses like district heating and cooling, on-site utilities, distributed solar, or low-carbon mobility. We aim to add an extra eight gigawatt of low Garmin distributed energy infrastructure by 2025. To achieve those ambitious targets, since our last Dreamforce, we're setting up a new simplified global organizations relying on four global business units focused on performance and more importantly, on customer centricity. That's huge. That's uh, so much change and so much progress. Incredibly yes. impressive. Yeah. Yeah. And the targets are, are tremendous as well, including scope three, including such a, a tremendous, you know, uh, direction for expanded distributed energy resources. Really fantastic to hear you. Thank you. Um, and so also I'm going to bring Megan back in here in a second, but um, but first we'll we'll sort of talk a little bit about energy consumers with this next uh, this next graphic here as as energy providers make this transition to clean energy. We aren't just you know talking purely about renewable generation. We're talking about the role that businesses as consumers and often producers, prosumers play in this transition. Um, and all of the things that that Eve Eve was speaking about, um, Megan. I guess to bring you back in here as a, a sustainable um, sustainable energy leader, and with Salesforce being you know a large global business consumer of energy, you are asking a lot more of energy suppliers, of utilities, and of those groups that we purchase energy from um, from from your work in the industry. M many more things are being asked than ten and even five years ago. So, can you talk a little bit about? Uh, Salesforce as a, a big business consumer, um, how Salesforce is manifesting our sustainability and our sustainable energy goals in this conversation and how businesses like ours, like like the work that you do now, have a bigger voice in what suppliers are providing and offering? Kelly, you are completely correct. Our approach has evolved drastically over the last few years. And so, Eve, it's great to hear how your offerings have evolved to match customer demand. Uh, really at the beginning of our own journey, our renewable energy purchasing was focused mainly on transactional elements like the quantity and cost of purchasing to reach 100% renewable energy. But we, we actually learned pretty quickly, and this is probably not surprising to most of the folks on, on the call today, that all renewable energy is not created equal. You can have two projects with identical transactional details that can have an, an enormous, enormously different impact on the world. So some renewable energy projects can displace more fossil fuels than others. Some are built at the cost of critical habitat for plants and animals, while others can provide invaluable support for local communities. So when we start, so we really, we started on a journey to understand how we as a buyer can maximize the positive impacts of our renewable energy purchases while minimizing the negative impacts and understanding what the best project looks like. And um, as Kelly mentioned, we shared some of those learnings in our more than a megawatt paper, highly recommend the read. Uh, but when we assess renewable energy procurements, because there are many different options in the market, those themes really come through. And we look at four main criteria, the first and most important being impact. You know, we're in this to maximize our environmental impact. We want to support net new renewables whenever possible, especially those projects that help realize the benefits of the clean energy transition that we talk about in that paper. 
Uh, we're looking for replicability. We have a global portfolio, so we want to avoid high effort bespoke solutions. And recognizing that we're a large and sophisticated purchaser, we also want to blaze a trail for other buyers to follow um, to further open the market to a broader set of cu customers. We're always considering the value and risk, so looking for tolerated anticipated costs and low uncertainty. We really want to make sure we're paying for competitively sourced renewables and we're seeing the benefits of those renewables as well. And then finally, logistically, is this, is this possible? What's the execution risk? Does the timing, the duration, the execution process all work for us? Um, so those are four of our main criteria. And ideally, we would always work directly through a utility or retail provider, as those are the right entities in the market to be purchasing renewable energy. As many corporates are out there buying renewable energy today, it's, it's really not our natural niche. And so we first look to utilities and retailers for those solutions. But finding those workable solutions is often quite challenging. And we find ourselves turning quite often to external solutions like power purchase agreements. Because two of our biggest challenges, and these have to do with the fact that we have a largely leased portfolio, which we're not alone in, but those two big challenges keep pushing us to VPPAs. The first is contract term. So those options that allow us to support net new renewables often require a 15 to 20 year contract term with punitive exit clauses. And unfortunately, as a lease, with a leased portfolio, we can't sign a contract with a utility or retail provider that um, exceeds our lease term. And so thinking about if there's an opportunity to offer flexible exit clauses that still keep the utility or retail provider whole, like shifting to a VPPA type settlement, I think there's something there to be explored. And then second would just be meter control. We often don't have meter control. Um, and so we have to work through a landlord um, in order to access different options. And so how can we identify increased bill transparency or how can we leverage a non-metered account to allow tenants to directly access some of these renewable energy options? So I'll leave it there. Our asks are definitely not simple, but we are uh, excited to work together with utilities and retailers to find the best path forward. Yeah, well, what I really like about the paper, Megan, is it, it lays out a framework that can be kind of, you know, adopted and used and, and you know, thought through by all parties in the market to say, how can we kind of use these key elements and more that you guys even nod to that aren't as fully fleshed out? to to think about to create offerings around and to you know address some of the unique challenges that you you spoke about um, for different types of businesses but um, yeah so that those are some stuff the Kuning Bauer is the oldest printing press manufacturer in the world with more than 200 years and to give you an idea on what Koenig and Bauer presses can produce I'm going to take you on a really short uh, journey through a typical day we all are experiencing um, so when you start today in the morning, the little glass container you have your cosmetics in that is printed with Koenig and Bauer technology. The coffee you are brewing, the coffee powder you're taking out of the metal can that is printed with Koenig and Bauer technology. The newspaper you are reading in the morning printed with Koenig and Bauer technology. Then maybe at lunch, short uh, uh, stop for a, for a, um, for a short snack at a at a. Um, fast food restaurant, the folding carton box, or the, the journals in the back printed with Koenig and Bauer technology. If you do the grocery in the afternoon, the best before date, the coding date, the coded dates on, on food and so on in a grocery store all printed with Koenig and Bauer technology. The money you are paying with your passport security um, um, items printed with Koenig and Bauer technology. In the evening, you might receive an order by you, you placed via the internet the folding carton box printed in Koenig Bauer technology. And you might have a party with friends in the evening, flexible flexible packaging, all printed with Koenig Bauer technology. So next time you're going to a grocery store, look around. A lot of these products, they are folding carton and so on, all printed with Koenig Bauer technology. Multiple touch points for all of us during the day. That's amazing. I don't think we get through. Well, I can look at the products here and know that I haven't gotten through my day so far without a Koenigenbauer printed product. So <laughs> thank you for that. 
Uh, Tomas, one of the reasons, one of the things we wanted to talk about today and the reason for today is servitization and, and talking about what were the drivers for Koenig and Bauer's digital transformation journey. Um, and one of the things I just want to talk about before that is this wasn't a journey you decided that had to happen because of what's happened in the last year. We've actually talked about this for a few years, and I know this was a direction that you guys took um, before the pandemic. So what were the drivers a year and a half to two and a half years ago for this for you? So um, we, we understood and we, we listened carefully to the market and to our customers because everything we are doing is driven by our customers. And we are clearly understanding years ago already that customer expectations have changed and are changing. So the products uh, are important, of course, our core products are printing presses. But on the same, on a, on a, on the same side, um, customers expect and demand for services around our core products, digital products based on the um, digital products and services based on the connectivity, connectivity of the presses, of our presses, um, which help our customers to be more, more successful, to be more profitable based on the usage data of the presses we are collecting. So to take that data and provide insights to help our customers to grow and, uh, and and make them highly profitable and successful in the industry. That's what uh, what we have learned from the, our customers. That's what's driving us. So great products, but as well services, digital services and products around our core products. That's really important for our customers right now. And uh, when we talked a little bit of, a few years ago, we talked about um, how did you start this journey? Because I think in servitization, people wonder how to start. Do I start with a new system? Do I start with a new process? Um, do I start with internal, external? So where did you start your servitization and your digital transformation journey? Um, Karen, I have to admit, it started all with Salesforce, I have to say. And, and <laughs> especially, it was, I remember it as it would, would have been yesterday. It started Dreamforce. We met with people um, 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 Salesforce implementation partners, but focus not just on the clear technical implementation of Salesforce, but more on how to differentiate from the competition via business transformation. And we had a lot of interesting talks to them and we decided, you know what, this is the right approach, not just focus on technical implementation of our CRM system, but on the other hand side, on the other hand, as well, focus on how you how to change your business. So we came up uh, so Dreamforce was in fall, was uh, in fall, and the same year we already started with a couple of workshops um, uh, jointly or invited uh, stakeholders from sales and service organizations around the globe, and we all jointly developed the vision for a company. So where do we want to go? Where want where do we want to be in a few years from now? And based on that vision, um, we set up a harmonized sales and service and marketing strategy. And part of that is, of course, the implement of both of this. Part of that was, of course, the implementation and the adoption modification of Salesforce. But even more important, we have that digital vi that vision for the company, the the um, harmonized sales service and marketing strategy. Have the management um, top down behind this and really make our um, um, employees, the all the people within the Königin Bauer family, understand what we are going for, our roadmap, um, our kind of north star our vision jointly develop together and work on that and implement it and, and work together on, 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 on that new approach. And, and that's I, I think part of, of the success we are seeing in, in, in at Koenig and Bauer, I have to admit. I think it's important, you know, when you said it was people think servitization or, or revenue due to servitization is because the company needs it. When with the shifting customer expectations, you were taking care of the customer by servitization, which was an additional revenue stream. So it's a win, yes. win, win for Absolutely. everyone there. Absolutely. That's awesome. And, and, and Karen, I think uh, the beauty is we share a little bit of the same DNA, you and Salesforce and Kurt and Gebauer. We strongly believe we can be only successful if our customers are successful. And that's why right. we put customers in the center of everything we're doing, and that's guiding us. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely front and center. Um, so, Tomas, one of the, the the next question I have for you was what we talk about digital transformation, and uh, and I when we talk about this, I want to show the size of your equipment. So, when we do servitization at scale and a digital transformation, um, we're talking about a, a very very large unit. So, if we can bring up the size of a printing press, and 
this is a uh, this is massive, right? It, we're not talking yeah, about yeah. changing something that's two feet wide. We're talking about changing something that what did you say is 140 feet long? Yes. Not not that press, but we build presses like this up to 140 feet long, like 19 printing units, and they're in the packaging industry, and that's what we really are doing, and we are doing it very very well, building this these printing presses tailored to the customer needs. So mm -hmm. every kind of press is unique as our customers' business models are unique. And and yeah. as you saw, I mean, that's really, I really believe it's beautiful press. It's award winning. And it is beautiful. And, and I, I always call it the iPhone of the printing industry. You know what? Everybody wants it. It's connected. Uh, it's award winning. And um, But it's not enough, as mentioned, right? We need yeah. to have service around these beautiful, beautiful products um, to help our customers to be more successful, highly profitable, and differentiate themselves as well from the competition. And right. the connectivity and um, the, the kind of 360 degree view towards our customers, I call it always the... 3D 360 degree view because we have the, uh, the, the con let's say the classic CRM data, but we add as well usage data of our assets into our Salesforce platform. And based on that, we really know inside out what's going on on the customer side. We really can even predict errors before they occur and can, can help customers to prevent unplanned downtimes and, and make them this way profitable and, and keep them. I'm really excited to be here today with Linda Yaccarino who is the chairman of Global Advertising and Partnerships for NBC Universal. And it is even more amazing to actually be here in New York City together in person. So welcome. Thank you so much for having me and asking NBCU to join. And it's so exciting to be here in person. It's really thrilling, so thank you. You know, Linda, you, you've been leading a global transformation in the media industry, and we're really excited today to talk about that transformation and what you've been driving in the industry. So we all live at the intersection of media and technology, and NBC Universal is becoming even more of a tech company. So tell me how you're driving that transformation uh, as you become a more digital and tech savvy company. Well, thank you. It's a really exciting time at our company. And if I could put the, the drive for transformation in a little context, it really is driven by the three main uh, pillars of our company's focus. And that's broadband, aggregation, and streaming, which is really driven by consumer behavior. As we all know, and as you said, uh, that the consumers are living at the intersection of media and technology, and our consumer-facing company is really about improving the consumer experience. So if we can get really great at broadband capabilities, we all know in the last year and a half we had to have the best broadband possible, um, but also deliver to consumers aggregated content. They're insatiable when it comes to how much content they want to consume. Just at NBC Universal and Sky alone, we have over 300 touch points, 300 brands that consumers can access content. And then of course, streaming, which is the way we all want to and we're all gravitating towards consumption habits of any type of content through streaming. So the transformation is really driving the consumer experience to be the best as it is possible. And that transformation has to live with best-in-class technology and then the best-in-class data mobilization, maturation, which obviously led to the relationship that NBCU and Salesforce has, because in order to improve that experience, we've got to really accelerate transformation. So obviously the pandemic has impacted all of our lives and many industries. You've written a lot about the topic of shared responsibility. Tell me a little bit of how you're bringing that to life in your strategy. Well, it's really interesting. The, the first time that I started talking about our company started really, really engaging on this idea of shared responsibility was way before the pandemic happened. And, and then when the global health crisis started, we knew that we had this invisible enemy that we all had to come together and stand shoulder to shoulder with our partners to help educate and inform the world actually on much needed information, right? That, that citizens across the world needed to have. So we came together with all of our partners to distribute much needed information on a daily basis of how to confront 
the health crisis together. Then as unimaginable as you could think things would transform, then our partners came together to fight the social crisis that we were all confronting. Now, here we are together with our partners to really confront an economic world recovery. And I give you that context because unless you have shared values with a company and a partnership, you can't just go into these type of big leadership opportunities together with a company if you don't have a foundational relationship based in trust. I often say, once I'm able to come to the table with one of our partners, like a Salesforce, I bring them to our customers and it's like being introduced to a mutual friend. So it's table stakes and then you can move really fast together. So let's just talk about our partnership, the partnership between NBC Universal and Salesforce and what we've been able to accomplish together, the trust that we've built and the goals that we're achieving as you transform your organization. Well, it's one of uh, our relationships at NBC Universal that we are most proud of and actually most bullish about moving into the future. What's so exciting is that what would have taken us a minimum of three to five years, and probably likely that five years, with resources we couldn't imagine. Because of our partnership with you, we're gonna get it done in about one year. And we're so excited. And what I always say is that, you know, if NBC Universal and Salesforce could accomplish this, because we're a good example or a beta for the entire advertising industry. If we could get this done, then so goes the rest of the industry because you're helping contemporize and modernize and sophisticate everything we're doing. And we are able then to make it interoperable with our partners. So again, we bring this partnership to that new table too. And I'm very, very excited about that. It is amazing what we've been able to accomplish in, in just a short period of time. I think how our organizations came together, you know, built shared trust and, and really uh, set aspirational goals and achieved them. So thank you for that. I, well, we, we, I, there is a mutual gratitude that our companies are having because when I think about things like even I, I listen or get updates um, for, for the meetings that our teams are working tirelessly, there's a couple of things I'm struck about besides the, you know, kind of media cloud and the products that we're working on that, that for someone like me who's been at NBC nine years now, it's literally a, a dream come true or a vision of the future that is here now that I'm enjoying experiencing. But what really comes out of our meetings is several next step work streams that are leading to a next phase of our relationship. And I think that is really exciting, but it's really a demonstration of how in sync our teams are, how clear and open the communication is and the ability to speak with such candor about what we can do together, but also to be honest about what we can't do and we're trying to build to confront those potential gaps that we have. And there's just never a stop. It's always about what's next. So it's been really exciting and we're very, very optimistic about our future together.